Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, executive producer and host of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. My guest today is Randall Beyer, and we're going to go through some of the books that we've received for Rip Rap. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, the Tao of teaching. In this sort of very pointed uh, moment in time. It's, it's respecting people. It's being in dialogue. And that whole phrase of the teaching moment. Mm -hmm. When you come into a crisis, instead of being offended and taking, you know, injury at it, yeah, you think, well, what can I learn from this, and what can I teach? That's true. Or what am I? What is it that I'm not seeing yeah, but that it, I need to be able to see? It's about learning. Yeah. What? What? The, what do I need to learn about this? Yeah. And what can I teach about it? Yeah. I wish I could just be like that more in my daily life. Well, it's a yeah. constant struggle. <laughs> There's no magic thing to it. Right, to always be in the moment, uh, present with yeah. the, you know, Be authentically that. present yeah. with right. Parker J. I Palmer. Guess, I guess it's, a, well, it's something to work for. It's something you must yeah. strive for. I mean, I have this in my own, you know, interaction with colleagues or teaching or you, you've got your, whatever you call it, ego and then the rest of the world and you somehow have to, you know, sort of, Put your put your ego back a bit to understand the full impact yeah. and really be present right there with those, and it's it's difficult to do. But this book is really deep that way, and I have it's it's a it's substantially enhanced my teaching. It's not a teaching methods book, but it is the positionality. It's yeah, how you're presenting yourself, how you're conceptualizing the classroom, just huge big chunks to, to really reflect on. Right, and it's helped me a lot in that way because. You know, we all have emotional baggage, as they say. You know, things that yeah, I think that's someone probably hits what that I'm button referring and you're going to. <laughs> I know, flare, you, you, you can't know? do anything about it. Right? And yet, <laughs> when you start thinking about it and become critically engaged with it, then you can, you know, step back from right. it and see, okay, what's going on here? Um, sometimes people attack out of insecurity mm -hmm. or fear or previous pains that they've, so they're attacking you as teacher. Right. That's nothing to you as, as a person. That you as teacher that yeah. they've had, had something happen to them. Yeah, you've got somebody. And so it's hard to step back because you feel like, oh, I'm under right. attack. Right, you're losing here. your own integrity. You yeah. feel like you're integrity, and that's that's it's very difficult. Yeah, it is. It's difficult. But the whole if, thing of if, being uh, in the moment, you know, fully understanding, and and you never do. Yeah. Fully understand what's going on. Well, this book starts out with a wonderful trope that we've all heard: a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Lao Tzu. And it's sort of like today's the first day of the rest of your life, or you know what other sort of little tidbits of wisdom that we've come up. But you know if you if you take them to heart and really think about them seriously, they have um, a f can have a phenomenal effect of getting you um, sort of out of yourself and well, in, in the moment. You probably a more. have colleagues, and I have them that feel like teaching is same old, same old, same old. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. However. If what you're doing is really looking at what this situation within is, that point, this moment, what's going on? Mm -hmm. it's, I don't ever have that feeling of boring or same old, right. same old because it's different people, different backgrounds, yeah. different interactions, and I really want to understand what this one is. I've got a job for you in retirement. You can be one of those greeters at Walmart <laughs> because every person is a new expo a new exploration. <laughs> if we could, if we could take that metaphor. Well, maybe uh, that's but what teachers are. The way is, na you know, it's got all these things that are, in, in my experience, kind of like reading the I Ching, you know, which I did as a college student all the time. The way is nameless. The name is not the way. Or virtue is its own reward. Differences arise when the way is lost. And if you can, some, you know, you don't always have cooperation by the other side, no. the other person that you interact, which is, you know, ultimately, I guess, why we have wars. And, and you know the sort of full-time international tragedies, but oneness, not fragmentation. If you, I think if these little, if these things can, not little, but if we can these keep these working, little messages, I guess, yeah, can. If we can keep working toward unity instead of yeah, division, yeah. separation, classification, work toward unity, celebrating, you know, hope. Celebrating the, the mm -hmm. what we do share as human beings engaged in a joint purpose. Right. Um, it really shifts the attitude of, of the classroom and the, of the students. You know, I just I literally just enjoy being in the classroom. I I really love teaching. 
And I think that comes across to the students, and then they relax. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are remarked, and I'm not trying to just brag, but I mean, it's joyful to me. So a lot of them just enjoy being in class. Yeah. Just, yeah. just the experience. And that's nice you know. if it can if it can happen. Yeah. You've joined, you've made something. Um, well, I think all teachers can do that if they shift the power, if they sh shift their approach. It's, it's really more of a celebration. You know, we're here, we're human, we're learning, we're mm -hmm. interacting together, let's celebrate that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that I've done is, is I, I, I haven't really changed my teaching style, which has always been based on this dialogic moment kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. But I have shifted it in response to what I see a student needs. And one of them is that uh, about violence. Mm. Because um, over the years I'm seeing an increasing prevalence in violence. I mean, I talked to one of my students. I said, well, you haven't been in class. She said, I got shot in the back. And in just the last three weeks, I've had three students who had co-workers or friends that committed suicide. Mm. So <clears throat> in response to this, I've started a new activity that just last semester where uh, one of the final things we do in the class, because over the class I'm working with them on critical thinking, you know, reflection, I have them write a two-page journal about some violent incident in their everyday life, and then what could they have done to either prevent it or change the outcome. And what was fascinating is I kept having students tell me that violence is inevitable. Hmm. And their They're participation in it. They're is waiting inevitable. for it to happen. No, they just so. see as well it's going to happen. There's nothing I could do about mm -hmm. it. And um, mm -hmm. so one of the things was is getting to understand there's roots of the violence in the past that come present, manifest in, in the present. And they don't think about that. And then another one I keep telling them is you can always step back and step away. You don't have to get into a violent situation. You don't have to pick up the gun. You can get away and leave it alone. Mm. And, I mean, they have a hard time understanding that because there's so much violence happening around them. They don't, they're not, you know, I'm trying to engage their critical thinking with the process. Yeah. And... Um, so that's been a very heart-wrenching, but also, I think, valuable, because sometimes when they're telling the story of what had happened, they don't see any way that they could any have changed out. it, any yeah. way to have changed it from happening or, or changing the outcome. And yet, toward the end of the, of the journal, they start seeing, well, they, maybe they could have done this. And so I tell them, that's where, you know, if you can find some way to deal with it and not have it look as inevitable. Right. But they're very emphatic, and some of them are, are just, just, you know, can never do anything else. Mm -hmm. But that came out of that Tao of Teaching mm -hmm. concept, is trying to work with the students to extend their ability to reflect on and respond to what's going on. Yeah. And the, the, the next one, the Pedagogy of the Press, I just love Paulo Ferrer. Um, and that's how do you teach people who are pressed, you know, in so many different ways uh, by how they're taught, by how the political system. It's a, it's a very clever title, like uh, uh, the play on words in English, the pedagogy of the oppressed, meaning how do the pedagog, how do the oppressed teach each other? But the pedagogy within, um, among the oppressed. Well, he says pedagogy and which begins with the egoistic interests of the oppressors. Yes. And yeah. it says, an egoism cloaked in the false genera generosity of paternalism. The way the, the way the oppressed are taught. It could yeah. have two meanings. And I think he's, yeah. I hope, I... Uh, well, that's what it's all about. I mean, it, it may have a different sort of ramification in French, in the, you know, in the Well, and it's, it's like original, the Tao thing. Change doesn't or happen... What was the original language? Was it French or was it, it was Spanish? Brazilian. Brazilian? Yeah. Um, Portuguese? I think Portuguese. But, At any rate. But the point is, change doesn't happen en masse. It happens one by one by one. You know, and that's what I really believe in, in, in teaching students. I'm not teaching a class. Mm -hmm. I, in fact, one student says, well, how's our class rank up against this other class? I said, I can't do that. I mean, 
the class to me is a yeah. collection of all these individual human beings with all their different skill sets right. and everything else. So it would take me a century to try to fully understand each of them and then you know contrast that to right. another galaxy of people. Well, just in the example we used before about the Tao, this is so interesting about finding sort of a balance among two, two others, two people who are at, at odds maybe. In this case, the two people who are at odds are both oppressed according to this model of pedagogy. So they have to find, they, it, one thing that one, that one needs to achieve is to understand that the person you are struggling with is essentially in the same boat that you are in terms of the power struggle. You both are at a disadvantage in terms of, of you know, mainstream culture, who's controlling the world, your economic condition, you know, your station in life. And so um, the oppressor quote unquote, the generalized oppressor, uh, succeeds and dominates by having the oppressed fight it out among themselves. Uh, and this, this, is, this is, you know, The first classic. step is the oppressed have to accept the oppression. The first step toward liberation is to not accept it. And, and that's why, like Barack Obama's phrase, the audacity of hope. Mm -hmm. um, the first step is to have the audacity of hope of, of looking at what do you want, what do you need. So you mean you mean not accept the oppression, right? Not yeah. accept the oppression. Yeah, yeah. And, and and then the next question is, well, what do you want? I this, thought you were giving me some Japanese some Zen koan there. No, you must no. accept the oppression to no, understand no, 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 that, no, no, no. right? Okay. <laughs> and I tell my students that I, the metaphor I use for my teaching is um, grass and concrete. Mm -hmm. Grass can slowly break down concrete. Grass has more Little hydraulic time. power than concrete, mm -hmm. which is why you mm -hmm. see all these orange barrels. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I tell them, don't worry about the concrete. Grow the grass. Mm -hmm. That's very relevant to mm -hmm. the oppressed because the oppressed feel that they're being held down. Mm -hmm. But that's not the question. Right. The mm -hmm. question is, how do you grow up through to do what you need to do? Right. And so that's what he's talking about here. How do you right. teach that? But I think he's also talking about very drastic situations where violence and oppression are so overbearing that the sort of historical dominance of a domination of a culture has occurred, um, and you know revolutions sort of come along to. In other words, you've got a. It's not just a slow erosion of the concrete, but. Somebody else, somebody figures out how to. Oh, it's pretty you know, extreme. Make a break in the wall and you know get some um, uh, kind of uh, um, a beachhead, you know, a, a beachhead of, of 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 change. But see, I think what's important is like we were talking earlier about. It's not same old, same old. If what you're trying to do is to have each person, which is my objective, develop their voice, who they are, mm -hmm. without regard for how do they fit in. But you know what? What do they? What do they need? Um, then, that's exciting and it's fresh. Mm -hmm. Always fresh, depending on mm -hmm. who that person is mm -hmm. and what particular constellation of issues they have with them. And it's exciting to have them work through it. You know, and and they're so excited when they're empowered. You know, and you can see the change in yeah. their body language and yeah. everything else. Well, it's true. I mean, in some of the recommendations or ways to. Uh, work around the system, I guess is the way to put it. Um, you're, you know, just take some common examples. I mean, who writes the history books we read? There have been con contentious arguments about the the history, the way the history books, what's being represented, even in our own our own history, our own U.S. history. Is there a truthful um, a truthful explanation of the legacies of slavery, or you know, uh, labor labor uh, revolts, or uh, uh, issues in the early part of the 20th century, um, you know, the coal industry or whatever you can you can think of the oppression of of women. These things are some, sometimes seriously kept out of the, the the issue with the incarceration of Japanese during World War II. A lot of this is kept out of the history book because yeah. you know the who owns the book. So what happens in response is small. Uh, uh, out of the mainstream education 
you know, learning in another context, I guess that's the grass moving the concrete. You, you learn in other workshops. You have, you know, workers' collectives. You have uh, local community activism doing, doing uh, historical uh, education, having the youth meet with people who actually experienced a, a situation so that knowledge grows not through this mainstream kind of classroom history book approach, but through other yeah, I have African-American students, for example, reading the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't always go real well because you really you know, look the at Declaration the words. of Independence were for a very Was small group small, of right. white, property, very wealthy men. Exactly. Oh, there's it, a whole new analysis of Abraham Lincoln. I just was at a... Uh, presentation by one of my colleagues who grew up, he, he's black, he grew up in the uh, uh, segregated sort of neighborhoods of Cincinnati, but he lived on Lincoln Avenue in Cincinnati and there was a big uh, statue of, of Abraham Lincoln with an angel on her knees, you know, before him. And he, he grew up at the same time, over time he came to realize Lincoln's feelings about about race and the full emancipation of the, you know, the African American population in terms of um, could, even though that population could be essentially or ideally free, does that mean that, that, that um, Abraham Lincoln advocated uh, full voting rights for African Americans or or positions of, of responsibility yeah, no. integrated completely into society. No, when you dig down into so, the Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you know, and on one level you can say, okay, okay, this, he was, was it political pressure that made him do what he did? Yeah. Was it his humanity? Well, you know, it's a complex, unanswerable in some ways, but this is how the hegemony of oppression kind of works. What was interesting in here, he says that just as the oppressor, in order to oppress, needs a theory of oppressive action, so the oppressed, in order to become free, also need a theory of action. And I think that's, yeah. what, that's what's really interesting, is to, to yeah. work with people. Because once you start developing your voice, then you know what you want. And from what you want comes out how you're going to do it. And that may or may not, they, they often will be maybe in conflict with what the same old, same old is, hopefully will be. But um, anyway, I, I really enjoyed all these. Um, there's that, the next one is, is uh, shocking, I guess you'd say. Yeah, this is very heavy. I mean, we're I guess we're, we're going deeper and deeper into um, the, uh, the, the underside of our culture, um, the slave next door, human trafficking and slavery in America today mm -hmm. by Kevin Bales and Ron Sudalter. Uh, published by the University of California Press, Berkeley. I mean, I, I probably could could um, make a few comments about um, this situation. But, you know, if you look at our economy and the benefits, certainly, um, of uh, having stores open, whatever these benefits are, the capitalistic, the commercial benefits of lo generally lower prices than a lot of other, other places in, in some ways, or even though prices have been getting higher. The services we can expect or pay for, it's all on the, the backs of a large population of lower paid uh, uh, folks who are not getting those benefits, especially the under, under the table economy. Well, what's shocking about this is that people have a very hard time understanding that there's specifically exploitive illegal practices in this country mm -hmm and come from the same greedy, exploitive practices that go on around the world. Around the world. And we someone say, oh wants, yeah, they just do that in, uh, in Colombia, yeah. right? Or and in someone China. Someone wants what they want, uh -huh. and they don't want to pay for it, and, to do, mm -hmm. and they want to exploit people mm -hmm. and take advantage of their political status, economic status, social status, right. Right. or personal deficits. And so there are nannies that are brought into this country, not given green cards, and so are terrorized, raped, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. There's women right here in Detroit that have been brought to work in the clubs and, and essentially be prostitutes or at least uh, what they call exotic, exotic dancers. Exotic dancers, sure. Completely right. illegal, you know. Um, and we have trouble understanding right. that this way of life that you, you just want what you want, use people freely for whatever you want, and exploit them. 
you know, it's it's just shocking that it could happen in this country, and it is. And um, uh, Bales and Soldalker have have had the courage, because they're part of the Free the Slaves Committee, mm -hmm. of looking at it without eyes wide shut, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. saying, yes, this exists here, you need to take a look at it. And when the book first came out, there was a, some smattering of things, but it still hasn't resulted in any a major change because you've seen the different political um, oh, sure, just over in. immigration, just the whole. Well, people quote, have been unquote, considered for different prominent positions, and then they do a check on them, and whoops, there's a nanny or a house mm -hmm. worker or something mm -hmm. that didn't have the proper uh, pay or the proper credentials, right. or you know the taxes weren't paid. They had a whole crew from Mexico yeah. build their house, and it was all done yeah. through you know all contractors. So it's right in this country, with, and it right. goes from the very prominent on down. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so it's it's that same thing of you know being where you are, and you know and aware. But it's just absolutely shocking. Do they recommend in this book a course of action? Oh yeah. I mean. He's, Related to immigration, for instance, or something like that. Yeah, you try. To, you, you have to get stuff straightened out here. You can't keep going on this way, and it's very corrosive. I mean, th some people are totally victimized by this. Sure. I mean, you know? uh, even collecting your something as mundane as collecting your weekly pay, if you're at yeah. if you're at risk oh, they're not like paying. that, uh, they're, probably they're promised not pay, and then they're um, held on. Yeah, and they're held right. in total of terror yeah. that if they say anything, they'll get deported. Back they go. And back to, yeah, to wherever to their they were. Yeah. yeah, or worse, you know, just uh, thrown out or farmed out somewhere else. But I just think it's useful to say, instead of pointing the finger at all these other countries, is we got some really poor. Right here. right here. Right. Well, there there's a lot of statistics to show that the United States is. You know, not up to speed in a lot of things. I mean, just looking at the status of our health care plans or our um, uh, prenatal, um, uh, our pregnancy, uh, not pregnancy, what is it? Infant mortality. Infant mortality rate yeah. is. Uh, the city of Detroit has is, is, uh, got a, a worse infant mortality rate than a lot of third world countries. Right. Well, now that you've suited, you've got me suitably depressed. I'll I'll bring up yet another one. We can go to another level of, of analysis here. <laughs> this one on food politics. It's a title called um, "Pet Food Politics: The Chihuahua in the Coal Mine." And of course, the metaphor of uh, the the metaphor of the canary being the little bird that when you've got too much carbon dioxide in the coal mine, the canary will will die. And here the metaphor has to do with, I guess, the, the pet food industry and uh, food and in, food industry in general. Uh, by Marian Nessel, who's the author of Food Politics and What to Eat. And um, She's also the chair of the nutrition department at yeah, that's New what York was, University. Okay. I was going to ask you And, you know, we interviewed her on the, the other, her other book. I and, see. And uh, she really took it to the food industry, saying, mm -hmm. you know, about the sugar, as I say, in the food. And I said, Marian, uh, Aren't you going to get in trouble with doing this? And corn, the corn starch yeah. issue. Yeah. And um, corn, she's still alive at tenure. I mean, <laughs> she really dishes out yeah. what the thing is. And the yeah. thing about pet food is that, you know, they've got this enormous industry that's grinding out all this stuff for all the pets. And part of the issue is that many people's pets are now their friends and family members because, you know, someone may not be able to have kids, so they have pets. and. So now you, but they got to be fed, and so it's just a huge issue. And they use everything in the food. <laughs> you know? Oh, I don't, I don't want to know what's in pet food. Yeah. I've looked at the back, and they're very clever. They don't have to say exactly what's in no, there. There's enough to they say. They just I say it's meat byproducts is enough for the the industry. That's they've somehow managed with it's the. It's everything, including yeah, the, the yeah the toenails. One end to the other. I I wonder if the um, is the FDA. Part of this, or is it Department of Agriculture? Who regulates Department, the food? I, I mean, the FDA is yeah. Department of Agriculture, but is it is there a distinction between human food and animal food? Oh, is yeah. what I'm talking oh, about. Yeah. There, you know, there's. Uh, but even so, what they put in it. Yeah. Uh, we found out with our own dogs, she's allergic to a lot of those mm -hmm. commercially available foods, and mm -hmm. it turns out that 
that's not a concern for the food industry. No. They just crank no. this junk out, and um, people buy it because it's available in the supermarket. Yeah, but this is this is on sort of the 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 politics of of, of disgust. How I that, suppose. Yeah. Well, it's <laughs> how that all emerged. Not to be flip about yeah. it, right? Yeah. It's so it's kind of like the pharmaceutical industry. Right. Yeah. You, you know, yeah. it grinds out what um, you know is convenient and efficient for them. Not necessarily with much regard for what it does to the animals. Well, given that example, I mean, there's been a lot of complicity between the people who are in the uh, the Food and Drug Administration uh, authorizing a drug to come out. The metaphor between the the example, the FDA authorizing a drug uh, that comes to market very quickly, and this this sort of uh, this sort of issue with pet food. At any rate, we had some great books to talk yeah, about. Yeah, thanks for coming back on Ripper. It was my pleasure. Hello, I'm Jim Schaefer, the host and executive producer of RipRap, the academic book television program. And what I'd like to do right now is to share with you how our unique and historic television series can use academic research to bring exciting, vital insights into important topics that affect our everyday lives. What kinds of topics? The politics and other dynamics that produce the gasoline from foreign countries for gasoline in the cars we drive. The way we care for ourselves and our family. Our sense of fashion. The ways we are attracted to other people. So, who are we? First, let me explain our name. We quickly decided that we needed a one-word title, like many of the popular television programs that were being broadcast as we started up. Like The Tonight Show, we wanted to concentrate on the word riprap itself, in the way the poet Gary Snyder uses the concept of riprap in his work as a construction of words deliberately set before the mind in space and time. And over the years, we've discovered that a wide range of people, including scholars and serious readers in the wider community, enjoy the topics we discuss. So we see our program as encouraging people to explore academic research because it's based on solid work. So that's a part of the riprap story. We're creating history as we bring serious academic research into the public discourse. Mm -hmm.